Today we'll be learning all about spreadsheets. Good data organization is the foundation of any research project. And most researchers have data or do data entry in spreadsheets, so it's a natural place for us to start. The problem with spreadsheets is that we tend to work with data and see data very differently than how computers see or interpret that data. This can cause problems later when it's time for analyzing, graphing, or sharing that data to collaborators or making it openly available. In this lesson, we'll learn how to think about data organization and best practices for working with data. So we'll learn all about good data entry practices. We'll also learn how to avoid common formatting mistakes, how to handle dates in spreadsheets because dates are especially problematic in programs like Excel. We'll learn about something called quality assurance and quality control. Trust me, it's not as boring as it sounds. <laughs> And we'll learn how to export data from spreadsheets into a more universal format. Let's start with an overview of good data entry practices, something that you, you might see referred to as how to keep data tidy, so tidy data. There are about 10 rules to follow when entering data into a spreadsheet. First, we want to be consistent, and that's in our naming, whether we're naming the columns or the naming the actual variables. And we want to make sure that our data is in a, a rectangular structure. And we'll see an example of this and the other bullet points in a little bit. We want to make sure that each row represents a single data point and that each column contains only one type of information. When we do this, we'll see that every cell contains a single value. We also want to minimize redund redundancy and avoid using multiple tables because they make more work for us in the end. We also want to avoid using colors, fonts, or anything that's visual as data because the way we see style is very different than how a computer, right? Like a computer can't see colors and fonts embedded in a spreadsheet the same way that a human can. We also want to use good null values. So we'll talk about what a null value is and what are some examples? We also want to save our data in plain text files. That's important for sharing the data uh, either now or in the future. And we want to use good naming uh, for our files and our column headers. So a few a broad overview of the rules that we'll be covering in our exercises. So this is a good stopping point to go back to Canvas and complete the first exercise on your experience with spreadsheets. Comment on if you've ever had something go wrong with using a spreadsheet, and if you haven't, that's great. This tutorial will help you prevent errors from happening in the future, and it'll set you up for working with data in this course and throughout your career. In this next segment, we'll be working through the Carpentries online tutorial called Data Organization and Spreadsheets for Ecologists. You can do this by working through the modules in Canvas that I have here, or directly on the Carpentries website. Once you complete the tutorial, including the exercises, this is something you could include on your resume. So you could include that you completed the online tutorial from the Carpentries, maybe give the title. And if you're applying to a summer internship, for example, that is something that someone in ecology will recognize and it'll strengthen your application. That's one of the reasons why I decided to incorporate it into our module today. 
if you're working through the tutorial using the Carpentries website, make sure that you go back to Canvas because we do have a few exercises and discussion prompts that you want to make sure that you complete. It may seem like a lot of material, so I didn't assign any reading for the week. The tutorial is both reading and the lab exercise combined. And if it seems like a lot of material, just take it one segment at a time. The tutorial mimics how you might go through a big project in real life, right? We've got this big project and we need to break it down into smaller tasks. And that's what I've tried to do in our canvas, as well as in these segments. So I'll work through the exercises online. So if you get stuck, you can follow along. If you are following along, I recommend having two windows open, like uh, side by side, the Excel window and the YouTube video window so that you can compare your work to what's being demonstrated on the video demonstration. Another alternative would be to have the YouTube video playing on your phone position next to your laptop screen. So we need to get a little creative. I went through a food trial and error to find a solution that felt right for me and felt comfortable um, going through the module. This way I could pause the YouTube video while, if I got stuck on something or rewind or fast forward. All right, so now I want to share the data set that we'll be working with in the tutorial. The data used in this lesson are observations of a small mammal community in southern Arizona in Portal, Arizona. It's called the Portal Project. This is part of a project studying the effects of rodents and ants on the plant community and has been running for almost 40 years. The rodents are sampled on a series of plots with different experimental treatments controlling which rodents are allowed into the plot. This is a real data set and it's produced over 100 publications and it's been simplified just a little bit for the workshop. So you can download the full data set and work with it using exactly the same tools that we'll learn about today. So when you're working with spreadsheets, it's easy to end up with a spreadsheet that is different from the original, from the one you started with. And to reproduce your um, analyses, right, you change something in Excel, how do you know you changed it? So it's important to create a readme file that it describes all of the the modifications that you made. So this could be, you know, Notepad or something in .txt, something um, kind of a simple file that describes, okay, your processing nodes, the dates that the work was done, and the steps that you made. So the first steps, right? We want to clean up this raw data, so you transferred maybe 2013 raw tab to 2013 clean. And in 2013 clean, you created a species column and moved information. Okay, so you can, you get the idea. So let's let's talk about these steps and why, why these steps are important. Let's go back to the Excel. So let's talk about structuring data to keep it tidy, following those rules we listed earlier. First, we want to put all variables in a single column. Each observation will have its own row. We don't want to combine multiple pieces of information in a single cell like this, right? There's actually two pieces of information here, the value itself and the unit. We want to leave the raw data raw. We don't want to change the raw data. Instead, we're going to create this new tab called cleaned, 2013 cleaned. And then we'll export the clean data into a text-based format like a CSV or comma separated values. This ensure, ensures that anyone can use that data. So remember, the rule of thumb when setting up a data sheet is columns for variables, 
rows for single observation and cells are single data point. This is a good stopping point. Um, make sure to complete the exercise for formatting in spreadsheets where you will take a messy version of the portal survey data and describe how to clean it up following the rules we learned about here. Okay, great job getting through that last exercise. Let's talk about those formatting problems. So let's talk about how to recognize common spreadsheet errors so that you can avoid these in your own work or help teach others in the future. A common problem that we often see is creating multiple data tables in one spreadsheet. You can see this in the portal data set. This confuses um, this confuses the computer and should be avoided completely. So we see these, there's three data tables in a single sheet. And this is confusing because a computer expects for a single row uh, to be a, a single observation. So the computer is going to interpret this row as being from the same observation. And it's not, it's from three different observations. Another problem is using multiple tabs. When you use extra tabs, the computer doesn't see connections that are there. So in this example, the 2013 is data collected you know, by one person in 2013 and by another person in 2014 and the computer can't make connections that these are from the same project. You're also more likely to add inconsistencies, let's say to column names, and you add an additional step for yourself when it's time to analyze your data because now you have to combine all the tabs into a single data set. And that's an opportunity for making an error when copy pasting. Maybe you, you don't copy uh, a column by accident. Not filling in zeros is another problem. There's a difference between a zero and a blank cell in a spreadsheet. To a computer, a zero is actually data. But a blank cell means that it wasn't measured and the computer will interpret that as a null value. So if you are measuring maybe observation, you know, the counts of small mammals, you go out to a plot one morning and there's zero small mammals, you want to record that as a true value. You don't want to use, you don't want to leave that, that cell blank. It's, in, it's also important to be aware of what null value you use. In this course, we'll use blank cells like we see here or NA because that's the default null value in R. Another common problem is using formatting or anything visual to convey information. So if you select the 2014 tab, you'll see that there's highlighted cells, and this means something. It means that the measurement device wasn't calibrated correctly. But this needs to be avoided because a computer doesn't understand style the way humans can. Instead, we want to create a new column to store that information. Maybe the title of that column would be notes or observations or um, um, you know, measurement, calibration, or something like that. Finally, let's talk about names. So we want descriptive column names. Think of your future self or your collaborators. You're not going to understand what variable one or variable two are. So instead, pick a naming structure that is descriptive, but still concise. And another um, thing to keep in mind is it's important to avoid special characters or spaces because programming languages like R are confused by these. And I work um, with a lot of data that ha can have special characters because of names 
uh, and unfortunately, you know, these need to be avoided because um, you know computers aren't as smart as our languages, our, our like human languages. So there's no exercise related to this segment. So continue on to learn about dates as data. All right, let's talk about dates as data. So what we're looking at is my cleaned up version of the portal data where I've combined, I've removed the three data tables and instead made a separate column for species. And I also made a separate column for notes. So let's talk about dates. It's tempting to store dates in a single column, but this is not the best practice because dates are stored in a problematic way, even though they are displayed correctly. Excel, for example, stores dates as numbers, as the number of days from a from the date of December 31st, 1899. How would you know this if you weren't taking this course? I mean, this is one of these weird kind of default settings in Excel. Excel also turns things that aren't dates into dates. So G names like MAR1, DEC1, December, it turns those G names into, um, into dates. This has been such a problem that there's entire scientific articles reporting on these, you know, thousands of gene name errors because people are using Excel and it's turning things into dates. So let me see if I can bring that article up. It is here. So mistaken identifiers, gene name errors can be introduced inadvertently when using Excel in bioinformatics. And it goes on uh, to say that there are thousands of identifiers um, that were, were flagged as erroneous because of this weird setting in Excel. All right, let's go back to our spreadsheet and talk about the alternative, right? Instead of storing date in a single column, it's much safer to store dates with year, month, and day in separate columns. This removes any ambiguity or confusion and avoids potential errors that are introduced by Excel. This is also more universal because some countries report the day first, then the month, then the year. Whereas in the US, we, we typically report the month, day, year, but this isn't the same for other countries. If you do store date in its own column, then use a universal format and designate your format in the column heading like you would do for a unit. Um, something like, you know, the four number year, the two digit month and two digit day. Let me expand this. And then this would become 2013, 07, 16. Whoa. What happened here? Maybe dates and times, maybe because, again, <laughs> dates are problematic in Excel. It's probably interpreting this as uh, some weird, some weird text format. So instead we have to tell Excel, did you see what I did? I right click format cell as a number, no decimal places. So hopefully, yeah, that appears now under this universal format. All right, and I just saw another error that there are the units for weight in these, in this column. Instead, the, right, you wanna pull that unit into the column header itself. This is an example of having two pieces of information in a single column, and we don't want that. We want 
one type of information. So I'm going to highlight the, the cells with G and I'm going to press Control F. And I'm going to select replace and replace with nothing. So that helps me uh, delete all the G's. All right. So work through the exercises on dates as data. There's uh, nothing to submit. Uh, in the next segment, we'll talk about quality control. And it's not as boring as it sounds. So I'll see you in a little bit. In this segment, we'll talk about quality assurance and quality control, QAQC. These are two methods for ensuring that data are high quality and error free. Quality assurance it happens before data is collected and prevents bad data from being entered in the first place. And quality control happens after data is collected and checks for potentially bad data or errors. In this segment, we'll look at how to set something called data validation rules in Excel and how to check for obvious errors. Later in the semester, we'll see how to do all of these things using the R programming language. So let's look at an example of QAQC in a spreadsheet using the small mammal, mammal data we previously used. So let's imagine it's a new field season. I have a new summer research internship and I need to get my data table ready. So I open up Excel and think about my column headings and the types of data that I will collect. I remember that date needs to be stored as separate columns for year month day. And I'm interested in these other attributes for trapping small mammals. I'll be training a team who don't have experience with Excel and I want to minimize potential errors. So I'll set some data validation rules. This is typically done by selecting an area of cells, usually a column. Then from the data menu, data, hover over to data tools. You should see this icon with two cells, one with a check mark and one with this not allowed icon. If you select it, this window pops up allowing you to select certain criteria. So in this column, I want to allow only whole numbers and you can specify the kind of data. So I want to allow whole numbers between one and 20 because I know that is the range of uh, small mammal weights that have been uh, collected in this area over the past 40 years. I also want to remind the, the person entering that data what, what goes in that cell. So I can use an input message, maybe the title weight in grams and something like um, the weight in gram should be entered. How about it should be a whole number between one and 20 grams. And to prevent errors, I can also set up an error alert. So I can show error alert if that invalid data is entered. And you can select different styles. In this example, I want a full stop. And the title may be something like check data entered and the error message whole numbers between one and 20 grams should be entered. And I select OK. So now you can imagine somebody's in the field. Remember, they're using one of those rugged tablets to enter data. They ready to enter the weight and they receive this reminder message that the weight in gram should be a whole number between one and 20 grams. Okay, so I'm ready, I've got my weight, but maybe my hand slips or the tablet is a little sensitive and I accidentally enter two zeros. So when I leave that cell, I select enter, I receive that error message that whole numbers between one and 20 grams should be entered. And then that's a red flag, I go back, oh right, I made an error. So I retry, okay. 
I can also make lists of choices. This is helpful for things that are harder to type out, like species names, where it's really easy to make typos, or if you want to save time. Let's say you're working in really harsh conditions and saving a few seconds here and there really adds up. So for this data validation rule, I want to apply the settings to allow a list. And in that list, I need to write out something called the source. And those are the species codes. So I'm going to use the codenames instead of the whole name. And the input message, something like use species codes provided, enter the species code, and an error alert. Well, for this one, I want to select warning because I can imagine that, you know, maybe you get a species that you can't identify or uh, maybe it's a new species that's not on a list. So you just want a warning. So is this a new species? If this species is not is on the list, then use the species codes provided. Okay, so I've got my weight. I it's ready to enter the species. Now I have that convenient drop down menu. Let's say I connect at, con, collect another specimen, and I don't know what it is, so I'm going to type in unknown. And I receive that error message. Is this a new species? If this species is on the list, then use the species codes provided. Continue. Yes. Right. Okay, so let's, let's see an example of quality control. What we're looking at is the you know, combined data from all those tabs. We've got the different field seasons from 2013 and 2014. We have our species in a new column, the date. We haven't yet, uh, we haven't yet created the separate year, month, day columns. I know that's on my list of to-do things. And um, we want to look at an example of quality control. So this is post data entry. And uh, a quick way to perform quality control is by sorting your data and looking for realistic values. So a few things to note. It's safer to use this um, icon here to select all of the data because there's a a real danger in sorting only one column and the danger that that imposes is it will scramble and thus corrupt your data and this kind of mistake is almost impossible to correct in a few weeks we'll see how to do quality control in r making it a lot easier safer and reproducible reproducible but for now um, Let's look at this example here. So again, we're under the data menu and we can do sort. If you only select a single column, you'll get this warning that there's data next to your selection. Do you want to expand the selection? And you always want to select expand the selection because if you continue with the current selection it will only sort this column and this scrambles your data right like the 33 grams will no longer be associated with this row so maybe i do that by mistake my data has headers let's see what happens right so everything stayed the same except for this and this kind of mistake is yeah, it's difficult to correct. And once you've made it uh, and you can't go back, um, your results are going to look very strange. And uh, that's why it's important to 
keep the original raw file separate from this kind of cleaned up file. And that's the really the only way you can tell that it's happened. Maybe your results are super wonky and you recognize a species that should be really big, but in, in weight, but it has really small values for weight and that cues you off. Oh, let me check my original data set. So I'm gonna control Z to undo this. And then I'm going to sort again and expand the selection and sort by weight. And I want smallest to largest, okay. So now the rows uh, are sorted together, right? Like all the columns are sorted together. And I can scroll down. Oh, and I noticed that I forgot to remove the grams here. So I'm going to do that control F, replace G with nothing. And now I've corrected those. And that's something I might want to include in the readme file of all the changes that I made. Right. And these values, they're all between, um, there's, now I can resort, sort by weight. And now I can see that for the most part, you know, there's some, really large species and uh, in this case they're NA, they're coded NA. So I don't know if that's a null value, like the species is unknown, or if that represents a true species code, I would have to go and look up the species codes. So a few other things, right, to point out, we're dealing with no values. What about these? Are these unidentified here or are they null? Or, you know, what are these here? Why weren't they measured? Why are there no values there? All right, I'll stop there. Now it's your turn. Work through the quick exercises, but there's no need to submit anything for this segment. In the next segment, we'll talk about how to export data in a way that is useful for downstream analyses. All right, now we're ready to talk about that final step, how to export your data. Storing data in Excel format, so .xls or .xlsx, depending on the version, isn't a good idea. Why? There are a few reasons. First, Excel is a proprietary format. That means that you have to pay for this software in order to open that file. And it's possible that in the future, Excel may not exist in 50 or 100 years. And making it inconvenient or impossible to open the file. Other spreadsheet software may not be able to open .xls files saved in that format. And different version of Excel may handle data differently, leading to these inconsistencies. Finally, more journals and grant agencies are requiring data deposition into these online uh, databases or repositories. And most of them don't accept Excel format because of these, um, these disadvantages. And it needs to be in one of the formats that we'll see this comma separated values or .txt. In this course, we'll primarily use CSV format or comma separated values. And we can do this by, by going to, in our Excel, let me share the Excel. So here's my cleaned up version I've extracted year, month, day from the date in individual columns. I've checked my weight in grams. There's you know, realistic values and there's only num numerical values. There's no text, there's no G unit in the cell. And everything looks good. Species has its own column, field season has its own column. And uh, you know, I might wanna add like a notes 
all right, but I'm, I'm ready to export this. I have all my changes documented in that readme file, and I'm ready to export this into a CSV format. You, you can select file, save as, and under the format, you, you'll find the CSV. And I use the, if you're working on Windows, you'll see this kind of standard CSV. There's also this form of CSV, which is designating that this is a, a Windows format. And you wanna select this if you can, and, and if you're working off of a Mac, then you might need to select the Windows CSV. But I would select this and save. So there's no exercise related to the short segment, but it's an important concept for you to know and understand the final task for this module is to complete this week's discussion prompt about our NEON data. So I'll be responding to discussion threads and I'll see you there.